Um, let me explain real quickly how this came to be. I got invited to participate or um, join the Amiga email thread inside here in AWS. RJ, there's a ton of different special interest groups all over the place, tons of mailing lists, and this one popped up. And so people were introducing themselves in, in the email discussion and um, explaining how they kind of got connected to the Amiga and what it meant to them. And I started thinking, to myself, well, wait a minute, I know somebody that knows something about the Amiga, and I've had the good fortune to go ahead and spend most of my career getting to work with my heroes and, and meet people that built this stuff. So I said, you know, let me see if RJ would be available to have this discussion, and you were gracious enough to do so. So thank you for joining us this morning. And for those of you, uh, you know, that are joining the call, let me tell you how I got connected to this gentleman here. It was about two, thousand i think or 2001 and i get an email from this guy rj michael so that was my first pause of oh my god why is rj reaching out to me and he said hey you're at sun microsystem you're working on this game stuff we're working on this little platform called red jade i don't know if you have kind of heard of this or what we're doing here but would love to you know kind of discuss this with you and i still have the red jade deck the physical printout here in my own personal archives as a game industry historian. And so we were discussing kind of what RJ's master plans were, which, you know, kind of felt like a follow on to the, the handy, which is the, the Linux and, or the links rather and those sorts of things. And it was at that point we started to get to know each other. I was able to interview RJ for the Art of Video Games exhibition. We did it at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, uh, which launched back in 2012. And um, your uh, and we'll talk about this later, you, one of the answers that you gave to the interview questions was one of the most beautiful and moving answers to why you focus on, on games and code the way you do. And I use it often in lectures that I give all over the world on why video games are an important art form in, in our society. And now I get to see you on a regular basis. There are game stuff. So RJ, I am so pleased to have you with us today. So thank you for uh, taking time out of your day. This is a great pleasure. I'm so <laughs> delighted to be here. I've got to look at some of these questions and I was going to like try to think of answers, but there's a lot of questions. And That's yeah, right. Just yeah, we're, we're, we're just going to have, we're going to have a conversation. So let's start with something that you put on your own website, which is the very first game you created was actually an electromechanical game, and you posed your website to ask you about it. So can you tell us about this first game that you made? <laughs> My tic-tac-toe game. It's so funny, you know, all the people I know that I really love and admire, respect in this industry, they all have these wonderful little stories about where they came from and the kind of things they did as kids and, and, and how innocuous it seemed at the time and who could have imagined where it was going. I, I, uh, I was a very poor student as uh, all the way through, halfway through high school, I was a very poor student all the time. And uh, I instead was one of these kids that went after the stuff that was interesting to me, the stuff that I loved. And those things that I really loved, I gave all my passion and all my energy to. And and conjugation of verbs didn't get anywhere in my head, man. I just like it. You know, I just couldn't do it. History in one ear, out the other. But man, if physics and chemistry and, and the way things worked, and I, I was really mechanically minded. And I early on got into electronics, a Heath kit for Christmas one year, which was just a wonderful thing. They don't make them anymore like they used to. The old, old Heath kits was just, you know, breadboard, and you had to like put your own resistors in it and everything and wire everything together. I saw one recently. It's, you know, clip in pieces and you clip in this here and you clip in that there. And it's more like working with a software tool than actually, you know, really building something yourself on a board. But um, it was, you know, stuff like that that I loved so much when I was a kid. And I discovered these amazing things called electromechanical relays, which you know, still exist today, but they hardly ever use because it's such a, such a sloppy thing. They use them a lot in pinball machines, interestingly. I didn't realize that circle came, would come back to me, but those electrical, electromechanical relays, I realized early on as a kid, you could use them as transistors. You could use them as on-off switches with each other. And I devised a way to turn 
that uh, whole battery of these electrical mechanical switches into a tic-tac-toe playing computer where it had absolutely no algorithm in it at all. Instead, young 13-year-old me figured out every possible game of tic-tac-toe. I did figure out mirroring. I did have, I did uh, imagine mirroring and, and man, uh, handled that in my switches. But other than mirroring, nope, every possible game was hardwired into the circuitry of this thing. It was this giant board, must have been, you know, uh, uh, three feet by three feet and just covered with all these electromechanical relays. And at the bottom, a bunch of light bulbs and a bunch of switches where you could turn on off to say what moves you were making. And man, that baby drained those batteries like you wouldn't believe. I would go through a set of D batteries you know, every, every uh, uh, you know, day, every second day or so, I would kill another set of D batteries. And, you know, I have four kids. And when my kids, ran, were, we, we were running out of batteries in the garage, we, we'd go over to Price Club and buy them bulk, you know, and we, you, you need more batteries, here's more batteries. And I would just give, the, give them away to the kids. But back then, you know, when I grew up, it wasn't like that. I grew up a kind of a pretty poor kid on the south side of Chicago. And, uh, and so, those batteries were precious, and what I had to do instead was become a better logician, a better engineer, and make my machine more efficient to use the batteries less to, in order for it, me to be able to play with it more. And so, hence, I found mirroring, and I started finding all these other logical reductions. If the player does this, you don't need all these other switches. You can make these moves, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. But it's, I mean, we're talking 14 year old me. I started, you know, back 13, 14 years old back then, goofing around with this stuff and had no clue at that time what I was actually doing and, and what statement I was making about yeah. myself, to myself, and to the rest of the world, even when I was a kid like that. Yeah, but you know, and if people forget, you know, back then, batteries being as precious as they were, we used to have to put them in the refrigerator. We thought, like, that's going to help slow their drain, or we'd get a little bit more life out of it. But so, look, you were engineering this stuff back when you were a kid, um, and, and that engineering mindset of wanting to build those things, but you were also very, you know, poetic, and um, you use language to uh, an incredible extent and incredible effect, you know. So video games, these sorts of things are starting. I mean, did you know that you wanted to get into creating games? Was that kind of the genesis of this? You know, what did you study as you went on to university? And at what point did you think, you know, video games, this new emerging form, I, I want to be a part of this? God, you know, and there's, there's a person out there, Ken Flysack, who I, I give a lot of credit to for this story because the truth is it was not only that but it was you know the um uh, i fell in love with television when i was very young and uh went nuts with that and, and we not only played it but i was so moved by there was a game called tank that i was so moved by that i went home and with graph paper figured out how to do all the pixel graphics for all of the objects the tanks the shots with the missiles and everything like that i, I plotted the whole thing out and if i had access to a computer then I would have created that game then, but I didn't. I didn't have access to a computer. The computer was young me, had a chance at, at a, um, uh, an in-law's house to play with this Intellivision for a whole day. And they had the Intellivision and then they, they didn't see little Bob Michael again for the rest of the day that day. They called me for lunch. I wasn't interested in lunch. They called me for dinner. I wasn't interested in dinner. They had to drag me out of that house at the end of the evening. I'm just fell so completely in love with the thing. But in my brain, there was, uh, um, because I was this, you know, serious underachiever in life. I didn't do well in school. I was getting C's and D's and occasional F's and stuff like that. And in my brain, I had to figure out what I was going to do out there in the real world to give where people would give me money for whatever skills I had. And that was a thing that I had to do. But over here was games and fun and entertainment and all the stuff that I did for joy. And, and I don't know if it was the, if it's just me or if that's the way I was raised, you know, I, I don't know, but those were always two different things. And you, there was no thinking of combining those two thoughts ever. 
and I went, I went all the way through college. I was, um, uh, uh, I, I was a, I did, a, I was a journalism major in college. I was an English major. I, I got almost all the way through with an English degree. I got like a, a year, a half a year away from getting an English degree. When I'm, I'm sitting there, um, uh, I'm, I'm, oh God, okay. So I'm sitting in the computer lab at, at uh, went to the University of Illinois and if any student could get an account on the computer at, at the school. Uh, they, they had an HP system where you could go and play Star Trek and all kinds of cool games, but you could also program yourself and stuff like that. So I had an account and I had I, the Star Trek game that they had there. It was fun, but a grid based and very slow and, and I didn't like it that much. So I made my own and I got my own Star Trek game that I had created on the, on the computer there. And I have this fateful afternoon where it's been rising in me now for a year. What am I going to do in the real world with an English degree? I mean, really, what am I going to do out there? What I really wanted to do was write books. That's what I wanted to do was write books for a living. But I thought, nope, you can't, you know, you're going to starve. If you try to do that, so many people try. I talked myself out of pursuing this dream of my life of being an author because I, I was too scared of being a starving artist and, and not being able, able to make it. And so I'm sitting there this fateful afternoon after a year of worrying and worrying and worrying. I'm sitting in the computer lab playing my Star Trek game and everyone I just want to stop playing it long enough to remember I'm supposed to be worrying. What am I going to do with my life? How am I, am I going to graduate with an English degree? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, I'll play the game for a little while. What am I going to do? And I'll play the game for a little What am I going to do? What am I going to do? It was this brilliant stroke that struck me and I ran immediately over to the English department and resigned and ran over to the computer science department and asked if I could become I, uh, student there. I, I realized later I should have done it the other way around and, and had them say yes first before I resigned from English. But anyway, that's what happened. And, and it was too late anyway, because when I graduated, I got an English degree anyway, as well as my math <laughs> computer science degree. So I got them both. I ended up with dual majors and I got a minor in philosophy because I just loved this, uh, the science of uh, the study of metaphysics. I, and I, I ended up taking every undergraduate course that they had and then begged my way into the graduate courses so I could learn more and more about metaphysics. Such interesting, profoundly deep and wonderful subjects affected me my whole life. Some of the things I studied in there. And, uh, uh, and, and, that's, and so <laughs> here I am today. And I got out of school though, and I got out of school with a computer science degree and thought, I mean, I was thinking literally, you know, I, I was going to get a job in downtown Chicago at a bank as a computer scientist and wear a navy blue suit with a white shirt and a red tie every day. And that's what I was going to do. And, and even then I'm saying to myself, I can't do that. I, I can't do that. That's, and so I, I got this job on the south side of Chicago working at this electron beam welding company. It was so cool. It was this interesting job that allowed me to make enough money to go run away around the world for a year. I spent the year traveling around the world. And when I got back from that trip, I was once again thinking, now what? Where do I go? What do I do with all of this? I have all this art in me. I have all this music and I can write and I, and I, and I can program. I've got a computer science degree. I love games. You know, what's the whole thing going to happen? I was talking one evening with my friend, Ken, we were in an arcade and, and, you know, seemed obvious to him what I ought to do. And I went and begged my way into a job at Williams Electronics and Williams to Amiga Computer. And... All right, so we're we're, we're gonna get we're gonna get into that too. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's, hey, okay, yeah, you know that's a little applause right there for our day. A couple of a couple of rings there, right? And uh, of course, you know we are going to talk a bit about um, a bit about uh, this that's going to come. Some, there's some ha raised hands. Oh, yeah, maybe yeah, not. no, no, yeah, we, right, we right, are. Right. I, well, I want you to ignore the chat. I'm going to go ahead and manage that for you, sir. I just need your big brain here. So, um, right. you know, one of the things that we've talked about before is, is so many people at the dawn of the video game kind of revolution and or, or emergence were pretty much the same way. You know, once computers entered our brain space, like everything else fell aside. I, much like you excelled early on in school and then once i got that vic 20 at home that was it grades went out the window you spend all your time trying to learn how to speak to this machine because if you could speak to it you could create you know 
uh, what you wanted. And it wasn't just about computer science or learning to program. It was also about the art and storytelling and, and sharing and, and, and collaboration and all of those things. So, you know, so many have followed the, the same trajectory, but you happen to go and do things that have helped shape the future for so many people that were there. So let's talk about you getting out of college and then getting into Chicago and the gentleman that ultimately helped you through the door there. So tell us real quickly, you know, how are you, how did you get into Williams over there <laughs> in, in Chicago? Yeah, well, it's, it's a funny story. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to get, I'm so I'm, so I'm in this arcade. And, uh, you know, you, you look around and there was really, this is the heyday of the arcade and there was so many really good games, but the, the games from Williams Electronics just stood out above all the others. You have Stargate and Defender and, and uh, um, Joust, you know, those, the, a lot of the really spectacularly good early games that, that had, the, uh, you know, such realistic art and the, the, the play, everything about them was, was great. Many of the companies uh, back then were really superb, but Williams in, in, to my eye, not only th they stood out. And so I would have gone to wherever Williams was, but happily they were right there on the North side of Chicago. And so I could just walk up to the front door and say, Hey, give me a job. And they said, you know, what are your qualifications? Well, I, I like games. And they said, okay, goodbye. And they sent me off. And, and I tried to get into that company three, four different times, was not able to find anyone inside that would have any pity on me and, and listen to my story of how good I was and, and how, how great I was going to make their company. And, uh, and, and, and until finally in desperation, what I decided I, that I couldn't get through the recruitment process, I needed to talk to people directly. And I thought if I could talk to the engineers directly, I might be able to talk my way in. So I went to the receptionist of the company and bribed her with a date to get a copy of the company's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she was a pleasant enough person, but I bribed her with the fanciest date I could, we could imagine taking her out on. And we did in fact go out on a real fancy date downtown with a really deluxe dinner. And we went to the, um, uh, uh, symphony. We saw symphony that evening. It was, it was a really good date. It really was a lot of fun, but I did, I, I, I bribed this woman. <laughs> a date to get a copy of the phone list and then started calling people one by one. And by the time I got down to the F's, I found this fellow named Noah Falstein who had some, uh, uh, had some mercy and, and gave me a, gave me a job at Williams on his project. He was the uh, heading up this project at the time called Sinistar. And I got to join his project and do cleanup. The project was pretty well along at that point but they wanted to get it out the door and they had all the stuff that they wished it had special effects and cool things like that, that, uh, that they, I came on board and said, yeah, go do that stuff for us. And so I did, you know, the, the, the game is this just remarkable development. It's the first mm -hmm. exposure I ever had to multitasking. It's got a true honest God multitasking operating system running underneath it where the uh, little workers, the little red workers in the game are on a very low priority. The warriors are on a much higher priority task and the Sinistar itself, of course, runs a priority one. And so, and, and if you watch the game, if you stop and watch the game for a second, you can see it happening. The workers do, 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 oh, think, oh, do, 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 oh, think again, do, 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 do. Whereas the warriors are like, yeah, I'm coming after you, buddy. And of course, Sinistar doesn't mess around. And then, of course, you've got this one. Run, coward. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Right. So one of the things that you were brought in to help with then was also voice. And the first game that we saw, oh, yeah, somebody said, I hunger. Yeah, we've got that one, too. Um, one of the, you know, the very first game, arcade game that had voice, uh, and it was Berserk. Um, and I think this, as the story goes, it was something like a thousand dollars a word to be able to kind of create this, right, the circuitry and, and, and all that stuff. Um, and it was the first time we had heard this. Sinistar was something entirely different. It was 
Um, it was emotive. It was frightening, right, to a young kid that would scream at you as you went by. So tell us real quickly, how did you, I mean, I believe you were tasked with helping them create the audio capture stuff. So you want to give us a quick little story about that? Yeah, there's a fellow out there who was the actual audio fellow. And the, we hired a professional voice actor to do the lines for us. We had, you know, the script and everything that had written out with the timing and stuff. And, uh, and this audio fellow, I could say his first name's Mike. I don't know if I should say his whole name because the truth is that Mike and I were both stoners and used to get together and get real high in the office late at night and goof around with the gear, goof around with the equipment, goof around with all the audio stuff. And, 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 you know, and he had pitch bending stuff so we could really horse around with this stuff and overlay audios and things and digitize it with different equipment, get different sound effects, weird space sound effects and stuff. And, and we were high and, and, and the script was there. So we, we recorded me goofing around with the script and now it's not clear anymore. It never was clear as far as I know exactly how much of the stuff in the game is that voice actor and how much of it is, <laughs> is Mike and me at 11 o'clock at night in his office goofing around. <laughs> well, you know, I would imagine that the 11 o'clock at night sound is this one. So yeah. that just has to be it. That has to be it. All right, listen, in the interest of time, we're going to move on to after William. So you, you know, you, you got in there, you've kind of followed the stuff that you were most passionate about. You're able to kind of bring together all the things you, you have about you, engineering and design and, you know, unique approach to, to solving these problems. Um, and so you're kind of living your dream job, right, at a, at a college there. And then this little startup, this joystick and peripheral company called Amiga reaches out to you. You know, what, what happened? Why leave Williams to go join this little joystick and peripheral company? Why indeed. The, um, uh, even when I found out the truth about the company, why would I leave such an awesome job at Williams to go and do it? Uh, the, uh, uh, I got the phone call from Amiga. They said, uh, you know, we're a joystick company, but the truth is we're developing a game system and we'd like you to come out to California and interview with us to help us develop a brand new game system. And, you know, this, this is Chicago. I'm a good old fashioned South side of Chicago, Chicago boy, you know, raised by good old fashioned Chicago people. And then California was a very strange place to us where, where, you know, my mom's joke was California is the land of fruits and nuts is what she used to say. And, 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 you know, it was, it's maybe not as funny now as it was back then, but it, it, it you know, it, that's what California was. And, you know, I, I'd heard about startups and people doing wild haired things like that, but yeah, maybe not. And so I said, nah, no thanks. Actually, I said, sure, you know, let's figure out when, but then I didn't call them back and we never figured out the date. So then they called me back again a second time and said, really, you really want to join this company? We really got a thing going on like you can't believe. And I said, yeah, okay. And then again, didn't call their person up to set up the flight. I blew them off twice. Amiga computer calling me, asking me if I want to come out and join their startup. And the third time I said yes, but then it's a long story, but we dropped a video game on my leg and my, my knee was destroyed by it. And I was on crutches with a cast on my knee. And, and uh, when they called the third time and said, come on out. And so I went out with the, on, a, on crutches, went out to California to interview with Amiga. Fell in love with it right away. The, 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 I met first with the, the president and uh, the um, uh, vice president of marketing sat down with me and, and uh, they talked with me all about the industry and what the opportunity was and what our funding was and, and you know, that we'd be able to make it. 
And, uh, but they said, you know, okay, but for the proof of the pudding, you got to sit down with Jay Miner and the engineers that are building the thing. And mm -hmm. so we sat, I, I went and sat down with Jay and, and Ron Nicholson was there at the time. Uh, I think it was just the two of them. And they showed me the whiteboard block diagram for this game system that they were developing. But this block diagram had, you know, they, they had a port on it for a uh, keyboard. There was an indicator that they intended to add a keyboard to this game mm. system. On further examination, I find a port for external storage. They've got the external storage plan for this game system. And so I went back to the president and I said, uh, tell me again, game system, right? And he's, yeah, 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 game system. So I go back to Jay Minor, game system? And he's, yeah, yeah, game system. <laughs> 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 oh, so funny. These guys were like, from the beginning, I guess, they were planning all along that, you know, if we wanted to do something more, we could. And, you know, Jay Miner had had such good success with the Atari 400 and 800 with them being real computers and stuff like yeah. that with real keyboards and things that, that he, he had a greater vision for where it might go. And uh, as uh, I don't know if you want me to keep talking, but as his vision turned out to be great because... Uh, it was, the Amiga was originally just a game system, but yeah. then uh, 1983, 1984, the entire bottom dropped out of the game system marketplace, in, and not yeah. just the United States, but worldwide. It just got destroyed. My own personal opinion still is that it was the success of systems like the 2600 that attracted a lot of bogus developers that created a bunch of crap software and it just turned the whole public off to the whole idea of trying to do that in your home. Nah, just go to an arcade and spend the money yeah. to have an experience there. Yeah, no, and I mean, and I, I, the bottom died, and, and we had a game system on our hands uh, in a, an environment where absolutely no one wanted a game system. And in a great panic, we, uh, you know, figure, we were trying to figure out, well, what are we going to do? when we all remembered, but well, we got this keyboard port external, you know, so we, we rallied and turned the system from the game system it started out to be into the computer system that we know today. Yeah, and, and I mean, and you're exactly right. I mean, the, the collapse of the home game industry, right, from 1982 forward, um, really didn't mean that video games disappeared, is that all the attention shifted, right? Focus. And that's when you got parents to readopt it by going, oh, this is a computer. My kids are going to learn things. It's like, yeah, sure, mom and dad. Yes, I'm going to do my math on this, you know, but instead it's all, all about the game space. And what's so interesting is that you also saw the other game companies like Nintendo, for example, trying to use game platforms as a Trojan horse into families' homes by calling it the family computer, and eventually you'll get all these additions, which never really panned out. So the Amiga was started as a game console, um, and then really the, really the idea was that it was going to be this powerhouse of a computer. And if you think back at the time, I mean, the Macintosh launched one year prior to the Amiga using the same processor, but they were worlds apart in terms of capabilities. And, you know, and as I mentioned to you before, I'll steal from Electronic Arts, right? You and your team really saw further than the rest of the industry did, almost to the point where people didn't know what to do with it. Like, you know, this thing is so advanced, like we're not sure where this kind of fits in the world, you know? so. When you talk about bringing those, those, those teams together and one of the, the key things for the Amiga platform was the user interface experience, intuition. Oh, yeah, so know. can you talk to us a bit about, you know, the, the, the operating system and intuition? What were the grounding kind of tenets or thoughts behind your approach to creating that environment for this powerhouse of a machine? Oh, God. Uh... You know, I've finally, I've done a lot of things with my life, but I, I, I may so far be pleased most with intuition than uh, was an answer that filled a desperate need and where it felt like there was only one way to pull it off and everyone got out of my way and let me pull it off so then that it could actually happen. We said collectively that we're going to turn the computer into 
uh, from a game system into a proper computer that we're going to sell on the shelves. But if we're going to do that, we can't possibly do that without a user interface. It has to have a user interface. All of the other pieces were there. It was a, we had a full preemptive, honest to God, full on preemptive multitask about multitasking operating system under the hood, full device driven and, uh, and uh, they, they, it was a full device driver driven architecture and, and, you know, with memory management and it was a complete rich, full system that had everything you needed except for a, uh, an, you know, a user interface, something that would lay on top of all of it and give the users the convenient experience that we needed. We had nothing except we had all the building blocks. We had a graphics library already. And the graphics library already had a layer library as part of it. So you could do not just control the entire display, but you could do individual windows as layers. And those things, all of those pieces were there already. So when I thought we were going to need windows, I could just use layers to do windows. When I thought we're going to need menus, drop down menus, pop up menus, we could just use layers for that. When I thought, yeah, but we're going to need to somehow communicate from those menus to the game, to the application that's running. Well, we already had an a, a event driven input system that, that was, it already existed. All I had to do was plug into it. And so on the one hand, it's this, you know, amazing accomplishment. And I won't, I, I won't deny that it was a huge thing that I managed to pull off because I did it in seven months. We said we have seven months to call it done so we can get it into production and you know, get make it for the shelves for Christmas, yada yada yada. You know, go. You got seven months. Go, and and it was it was probably the greatest engineering accomplishment of my life in the sense of precision, because man, I had that job down so well that I wasn't estimating tasks in terms of days, but I was estimating tasks in terms of number of hours it would take me to get this done. Okay, I got to connect this to that piece. That's going to take about three and a half hours. It was like, it was insane. It was this insane thing. I worked there basically nonstop, either in the building or we had a um, residence in that we had rented that was less than a mile away from the building. Uh, so I didn't have to drive the, you know, 45 minutes back and forth to my apartment. <laughs> I slept in a residence and right there at the property practically. And, and, and they, they, they brought me meals so I didn't have to go out and eat. And so it was just an astonishing thing. And, uh, and, and I, I'm, I'm delighted that I managed to pull it off. And, and we have, we were able at the launch of the Amiga to have a full, complete uh, a user interface that was, uh, not only complete, but it had even some unique features that I got patents for that, that other, other operating systems have since uh, duplicated. But, you know, we, we uh, not only created a user interface based on what I understood the state of the art to be at the time, but we managed to invent some stuff with it. But I did have in my mind the state of the art, what that was. I'd seen the work that had gone on at uh, Slack and uh, at... Um, uh, seeing the work that uh, with uh, Apple on the Macintosh and the Lisa and stuff like that, I had a sense of the what kind of building blocks you would want in order to create a usable interface. But we immediately, as soon as I started thinking of the problem, we shut me off from the real world and put me in a dark room with a, a pad and a pen to invent the entire thing from scratch. And I didn't look at anything. I didn't even look another user interface in the eye during the uh, beginning design stage because I wanted as much as possible to have it done as cleanly as possible then you know, we, uh, I, I would be able to claim ignorance to someone else's patents later, you know, because I simply didn't know. I had no idea what, what was out there. I just came up with what I finally managed to come up with. But yeah, it was, it was a, an astonishing thing. Seven, seven months of nonstop, practically 100 hours every week, 100 hours often, and practically every week, it was 100 hours for seven months. Baby, what a thing. Gosh, incredible. And, and so, all right, so you, you build this interface. I didn't realize it was seven months. First of all, that's just insane on its face, right? But 
a, a good point for everybody that is joining us today to remember, you know, RJ's kind of journey into where he was at Amiga. Um, don't close your, your ears and your mind to people that may not have all of that experience coming in, but want to do great things in the world that are gonna throw themselves into it, right? It's important that we make sure we listen to those ideas because in a lot of ways, I mean, you know, you guys and gals at Amiga, didn't know what you didn't know. You just knew what you wanted to do, and so, right? And so you just went off and you did it in spite of everybody else, you know, is saying no. Um, and and really things that kind of changed the way we thought about system architecture, right? The software and hardware didn't seem to be separate thoughts, right? At Amiga, it was really everybody in on design. Can you speak to that briefly? Yeah, and also, by the way, this is, again, we're talking about the early 80s. This is long before the internet craze, the investment craze, people spending $10 million on a sock puppet commercial at Super Bowl. You know, it was long before all of that insanity. Um, 3DO, when we get to 3DO, was a, a, a system that was sold. It was sold on vapor. You couldn't do that back during the Amiga days. It had to be a real system. You had to show up with, you know, real hardware and real software and stuff like that. And, and um, uh, the, for me, the, the most amazing thing about the Amiga was the, the, the way it was this labor of love for everyone, not just the hardware and software de designers, but even the business people, the people that... Um, the, 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 we had this one accountant who we gave her the... the job title of chief firefighter and gave her an actual firefighter's hat to wear around the office because she was constantly putting out our, you know, the, the flames with, with, we owed people money and stuff like that. It was just an astonishing group undertaking. But it was even more than that as all of the software companies that got involved with it because they really loved it and they wanted to be part of this new thing that was happening. EA itself became so enamored of the Amiga that they put huge numbers of resources behind it. And it was perhaps EA more than any other influence in the early days that helped the Amiga get established because they were giving so much of their energy to it. And it's not just games, which everyone, you know, of course the games, but deluxe paint became a legend in the Amiga story. And, and it's just, you know, this astonishing thing that Electronic Arts did for all of us. It was that group effort. It was everyone believing in it together and making it happen together. They, one of my favorite stories of that is uh, uh, we, the Amiga has line draw because one of the hardware people said, you know, if we just mess with the system, the hardware system, just a little bit this way, we can turn it into a line drawing system. And, uh, and, and it was like an invention of Dale, that with Dale Luck, the hard, one of the software people. And the hardware guys, we're minutes away from we're supposed to go to tape out with the hardware. They should have said, oh, hell no. <laughs> and instead they said, let's give it a try. I mean, that's, that's the kind of spirit it was where today, you know, in, in a, a company, I'm a more logical, correctly thinking, let's not lose money company, they probably would have said, oh, hell no. But man, we would just go for it with stuff like that. We said... Oh, if we're going to get the machine out, we have to have a user interface. You got six, seven months. Can you do it? Sure, I could do that. Get out of my way. <laughs> how, hard can it, how hard can it be? It's just a bunch of windows and colors on the screen. It's not a problem, right? Okay. All right. So, you know, it's this joint effort. Everybody's in on the mission. Um, the Boing Ball demo is shown, and people are like, we have no idea how you're doing this. There's got to be another machine kind of running this behind. And it's at that point that Amiga is kind of finding a difficult uh, place to get a toehold. And now it's a, it's a funding problem that has to happen. And so in, right, enters, a t enters Atari, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, briefly, because I've got about 20 minutes, to, I want to get you through this and then talk briefly about the links and uh, the, the 3DO and then open up some questions and answers for everybody. So Atari steps in, they offer you a lifeline, which really wasn't a lifeline for Amiga. Can you talk about that briefly if you're able to? Yeah, and, and I'll be brief. Sorry, I know my stories. <laughs> oh, sorry, but hey, no, don't no. apologize at all, please. 
so we're um, we're running out of money. We uh, the uh, initial funding dried up, and we need to retarget the system. And the people didn't believe in the new system. Yada yada yada. And and so we're getting desperate for money. Meanwhile, there's this drama that has taken place elsewhere in the industry, where this the, this uh, one family had been in charge of Commodore, but Commodore computer. Uh, which made the Commodore 64 a hugely successful uh, system. They were um, uh, they 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 had a big falling out with each other, and this family instead moved to California and bought uh, Atari, hoping to figure out a way to use Atari as a weapon to sink Commodore as a corporation, mm -hmm. and uh, they latched onto the Amiga computer as the way they would do that. They found. Uh, they're, they're, they're not the most scrupulous business people in, in my experience. And, and they found that Amiga was hurting. Amiga was starving, needed the money. And they thought they could take this machine and use it as a weapon to destroy the Commodore 64 and, and ruin Commodore's business. And, uh, and, and they were just real nasty negotiators, heartless negotiators, because they simply didn't care about the people. They just wanted to get their hands on the hardware to simply use the hardware to destroy the C64. And so it was, it was mean and cruel and, and painful. And, and, and we all watched the company fall apart in front of us. And we all knew, well, not, not the whole company. I was on the other side. I was already, they were already thinking of me as a director for the software group at this point. And so they were including me in a lot of these discussions and, and it was desperate. It was looking really desperate. And the more that Atari knew they had us over the barrel, the less, they were, you know, even thinking about being generous. They were just kind of shoving us under. And, uh, and happily for us at the last effing minute, man, Commodore heard all of this was coming, uh, was happening, contacted us, offered us more than four times as much per share for the company and saved our bacon at like the very last second. It's like, you couldn't have cut it any more fine. We had to return the money that Atari had loaned us. And Commodore cut the check to the, the pre, Dave Morris, the president of the company, got to walk it over to Commodore and slap it on the desk. <laughs> oh, gosh, I wish I could have been there for that moment when <laughs> he saved us. And, uh, the whole thing saved us. And so, and Commodore swooped in bought the company and wasn't just the money to keep the company alive and, and to make payroll and stuff like that. And, and here's a story for you uh, that I advise you do not follow. Jay Miner, one of the two founders of the company, to keep us afloat, took out a second mortgage on his house so we could make one, a payroll so that the company, the, the employees wouldn't lose faith because they were afraid of people leaving the company if we didn't make payrolls. And so he personally took a second mortgage out on his home so we could uh, make payroll. And, and then Commodore finally paid him back. But Commodore came flooding in with, with saved our bacon. But then we're, there's, we've got, the, there was this little thing called a Sage computer that's like a, like a, a, a Volkswagen with only one cylinder still working. <laughs> And we got 10 software engineers pounding on this thing, pounding on this thing. Commodore comes in. Suddenly, each, each engineer's got a giant Sun Microsystems workstation. To work. Oh, my God, it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and even better, perhaps, Commodore came with a whole host of engineers who knew what they were talking about and who had been around through the C64 and stuff like that were just brilliant influx of great engineering skill and money and, 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 and sadly, marketing people. They also brought their own marketing people and the marketing people destroyed the Amiga computer. It took them a few years, but they destroyed the Amiga computer. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to park <laughs> that thought because that's a whole other uh, dissertation level discussion that we're going to have all right so in the in the next 15 or so 20 minutes i'm going to lead us down to uh, uh into the next two things and so all right so the amiga launches in which eventually became the amiga 1000 really uh fantastic machine does really incredibly well in the market really starts to light people's imagination 
And that success then started to breed the, oh, we need to have a line of Amigas to fit any you know, of, of the different segments that we want to go after, which then also created confusion in the market of, wait, well, if I get this Amiga 500, it doesn't have this much, what is this memory that I need? Like, why can't I just play the game like I could on my old game systems? And now we've got the Amiga 500 and the 500 plus, and I think the 600, then, and now the, thousand, the 2000. So now it's this, we've got this success, but now we're gonna spread ourselves th thin. What was, you know, apart from marketing, what was the kind of, you know, when you saw that decline, what was the moment that you said, okay, it's time for me to leave Amiga and go on to do something else with my friend, specifically Dave Needle. Mm -hmm. Well, before Dave Needle came, Dave Morse, who was our fearless leader at Amiga and was my fearless leader for two other projects after that with Dave Needle and, and Dave Morse together, the three of us, we were an excellent triumvirate. Needle did the hardware, I did the software, Morse did the business, God, it was amazing. But before all of that, uh, after Commodore bought Amiga, uh, they cut the head off, uh, gave Morris a payout and, and, uh, and put their own person in charge of the company. And so I was having uh, lunch with Morris uh, a little while after that. And, and he looked at me kind of slyly. And so how's things going at, at Commodore? Oh, you know, it's a great, Amiga's still wonderful and all that. And he says, uh, you're making a lot of money, having a lot of fun there? Yeah, I'm making a lot of money, having a lot of fun. Could you make more money if you were working for companies that were developing? Yeah, I probably could make more money if I were, well, you know, maybe you ought to consider it. So he talked me into it and I quit Amiga when the quitting was good and started hiring out my services to software companies that wanted to develop Amiga games and Amiga, you know, applications and stuff like that, because who would know the API better than, you know, one of the people that had actually developed the API. And so I went off on my own and, and did independent work for several years, uh, uh, taking advantage of my Amiga knowledge. But uh, the whole time Morse and Needle and I were plotting in the background to do a, a, another game system. We always wanted to do another game system. And so I don't remember, 80, 88, 89, something like that. We got together and, and uh, developed a handheld game system called the Lynx that was, again, a remarkable system. It was the first ever um, uh, color handheld game system and, and uh, um, was a powerful little beast, had a lot of really cool features in it. And, uh, you know, again, we developed a wonderful system where the, the again, blitter, right? The money, and what? The, the blitter, which the blitter, which could also let you do sprite scaling, which nobody had ever seen in a handle, let alone it wasn't really done on on consoles at the time either. Yeah, it also not only had sprite scaling, but we had this mock 3D rendering even that we put in that was just really fake 3D rendering. No one ever used it because it was so bad, but we, it was in there. <laughs> but if you did, if you like, tried to render a cube using this, if a cube that had an image on the surface of the cube, it looked instead as if the uh, cube's surfaces were made out of rubber and someone was inside pulling the rubber in toward and then letting it, and then pulling it. <laughs> it was really, really bad. No one ever used it. <laughs> Okay, so you guys get together, you create this, this thing, and Epix is the company that you're at now, and they're funding this. And Epix was known for build, you know, video games in, in the early days and, and early computer games. So now they're going to go build this piece of hardware. Then something happened, and yeah. once again, the team was looking for money, and you know, I'll even play a different one. Here you go. Then along comes Atari again. So can you tell us how it roped back <laughs> out of the team at Epix and then back over to Atari. Yeah, so Atari was looking to get into that space because Nintendo was making money hand over fist with their device, which uh, and Nintendo back then, I think they lost their way. Back then they were so successful because they let everyone else make the big expensive units. They would make the dirt cheap ones that the mass public wanted to buy and the mass public was okay with four shades of gray instead of 256 colors and stuff like that. And so 
they were just, you know, constantly making huge amounts of money with their stuff. And, and um, Atari wanted in, so they decided they were, uh, wanted to get the links. But meanwhile, <laughs> uh, if you might remember VHS games. They used to be these wonderful things called VHS games where you would play a board game and then have to stop the board game to watch a, a tape on your VHS deck for 15 seconds, and then you'd stop watching it and you'd go back to the board game. It was completely useless. It added nothing of real value to consumers, but it cost millions of dollars to create these things. Mm -hmm. And and Epix went and spent the money they were supposed to use for our links. They, they spent it on the, the marketing and the production for this other project that was a complete failure and they were out of money. And so uh, once again, we've got this hot piece of technology that we created and the company that possesses it is, is looking for money. And once again, they turned to Atari to see if Atari would rescue them for it. And, uh, and Atari had such a bad reputation. The, the people that ran the company were such evil players. I personally have friends that have these horror stories about dealing with them. And we just didn't want to. And we told them that if you, if you guys make a deal, we told Epix, if you guys make a deal with Atari, they're going to screw you and they're going to drive you out of business. They're going to find a way to screw your company, take your assets and drive you out of business. And, uh, and they're all like with their cigars. Oh no, we, know, we got good lawyers. We know how to, yeah, yeah, yeah. don't worry about us. Yeah. And uh, Needle and I said, nope, we won't have anything to do with it. And we said, if you're going to sell it to Atari, then we're going to quit. And they sold it to Atari, so we quit. And um, uh, and then uh, it took about a half year, but then Atari drove Epix out of business and got all their assets and everything for, for yep. that. Well, listen, with regard to the VCR game, I have a couple of them sitting behind me, as well as my signed links, right, from back in the day. So, you know, it's it's my my house is littered with, you know, all of the, the crazy invention, not the VCR game, right, uh, of, of your life. So now, okay, here you are. The links goes back over, or the, the handy, as the project was known, um, leaves Epix. It goes over to Atari. They remodel it into the Model 2. You and Dave are now out of the company. Yeah. Enter enter 3DO. Which that was the very I, next day. <clears throat> and I remember very the stories. Day. I remember the napkin stories, right? So please share with this audience here. How did you guys decide to not only do this, but what was the, you know the discussion you had around that napkin that set the 3DO in motion? It it started much earlier when we were doing the links because our our call with the links was as dirt cheap as possible we wanted that gorgeous display that the links ended up having uh and it was it was after meticulous work finding just the right display just the right re reflector dozens and dozens of of attempts at it i have some of those attempts i have some of the early links prototypes too from uh, from the early days when we were trying to figure out the uh, initial case and uh, oh i've got such stuff oh chris uh, you mentioned red jade i'll show you some of the red jade stuff no, another pre uh, that's another preservation project not for this audience but yeah we'll have that right. discussion <laughs> but uh, um, uh but uh, the entire time you know we were doing a dirt cheap thing and it was okay because it was supposed to be dirt cheap but there was so many shortcuts and you know little horrible little things we put in but we did put in some smart stuff anyway like we had a um a, a dead man timer in there that we put into the hardware that you had to go and tickle i don't remember it was once a second or something like that your software had to go and tickle it at least once a second to keep the system alive otherwise the system would think it was hung on something and and reboot the system for you and you know i mean it, when we were putting in little touches like that it made us homesick for real systems with you know real memory protection and stuff and and uh needle and i had always had this ongoing discussion since the amiga days we were all such kids when we did the amiga there was so much that we were naive about from naive about things like 
the Amiga had no hardware protection in it for the memory. There was no way to protect your hardware. Any application could scribble on any memory anywhere in the operating system. And sadly, what that meant was often if you had a pointer in your code and something went wrong and you got a null pointer, that meant you were writing to memory location zero and memory location was the only absolute memory location in the entire Amiga operating system. Memory location zero pointed you to the primary data structure that pointed you to all the other data structures that supported all the libraries and everything else. We designed it so that memory location was the only one you couldn't touch. And of course, an error results in the null pointer, results in memory location zero being the one you definitely will be touching when things go wrong. And, and so it's just, we were so dumb in so many different ways from dumb like that to dumb like uh, I should have done the user interface as a proper system device driver. Instead, I created it as a library that sat on top of the operating system and that ended up coming to bite me once, but it was a terrible, terrible blow. It was in the call to open a new window where there was finally a deadlock condition that I couldn't get around because I, I wasn't a device driver, and so I couldn't control uh, semaphores at a no, low enough level. So instead, I had to put a busy wait loop in my code where I would sit there and test over and over and over again for this one <laughs> lock to come through. Oh my God. All right, but all right, so you've got all these lessons learned. Now you're, now you're building 3DO, what, you know, you the, the story goes that you you met at was it a pub or a restaurant yeah. or something and wrote out the block diagram for 3D on the back of a napkin. Yeah, we, I mean it was like it was almost obligatory. I think that was the way the legend goes in Silicon Valley that you have to do it on a restaurant napkin. And so we did. Yep. It was the very next day after Needle and I said, "Okay, we're gonna quit. If you do this, we're gonna quit." And so just to show them. The very next day, the three of us got together for lunch and said we ought to do a system like, like the 3DO. And we then proposed the satellite-like system that we ended up creating with the bus architecture, where uh, it was a central bus that would reach out to the, the devices that it, it needed to connect with. And, um, and Neil and I, as we were talking it through, drew out what that system would look like with the various satellite components around the central processing unit of the system and where the memory would fit in all of that. And we, we sketched out the block diagram of what we would do. Uh, um, we didn't even decide, you know, anything like architecture or memory size or anything like that at that meeting. Uh, we might have talked about possible CPUs, but what we decided more than anything else was yeah the three of us are going to go try again and, and we're going to go and raise a bunch of money and try again i can't believe it man we're going to go do it again <laughs> See, but again going back to you seeing further than most of the industry could i mean that's the hallmark really of your career is building these systems that are ahead of their time and in some ways and you discovered with the 3do reached a bit beyond where the technology was at the time but we'll get to that in a moment um, so this design and this idea then captures the attention of Trip Hawkins, founder or co-founder of, of Electronic Arts, right? And he sees uh, this, and I believe it was somebody that you knew or th that one of the, the guys that was doing finance for you knew Trip and mentioned it to him. Then the meeting happens. How does that meeting go? Yeah, my God, so Trip, there, there was a VC. Oh, he's going to hate me that I can't remember his name right now. He was, he was our, well, you know, one of our great actors in that story. Darn, I'll, I'll remember his name before we're done. Uh, uh, was, uh, ran in Trip's, Trip Hawkins' circle. Trip Hawkins was the founder of Electronic Arts, which is, I, I believe, still today, the world's largest entertainment software company. And he was, at that time, walking around talking to venture capitalists saying, you know what we need? I'm fed up at Electronic Arts. I'm fed up with the fact that you, you, we can't develop a game at EA. 
but instead we have to develop 17 games at the same time because there's all these different configurations of hardware. And even if you just consider PC, there's 12, 13 different PCs. And then now there's all this other and says, what we need is one system to rule them all and in the darkness bind them. That's what we got to do. And so his plan was that he wanted to, uh, he was hoping to recreate the idea of the uh, success of the VHS system, where there was a standard called the VHS, but anyone could make a VHS player. They, and except Tripp's idea was he was going to get anyone to be empower anyone to make a 3DO player, but he'd get money for it. He'd get uh, money from the hardware makers as well as money from the, the software makers. It was a real stupid idea, but that was the idea that we would charge the hardware manufacturers to license the idea and make the players with the idea uh, and, and also uh, raise money from the software. But that was, he's walking around with this, you know, uh, not a, a written presentation, just talking to VC saying, I got to solve this problem. I need a game system that's going to solve this problem for me. And then this same VC who's heard Trip say this, then Dave finds out Dave's working on something, comes over and meets us at our facility. And we've got this brand new game system that's almost done. That's, you know, we've already got these spectacular demos up and running on the thing. And this guy's like jaw drops and hits the table. Oh my God. <laughs> and he gets to be the angel that connects the two, you know, you know, it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I could just imagine Trip and knowing him to see him in the room with that. Also, in fairness, the idea of creating a standard, not that crazy at the time, because if you remember at the time, Microsoft was trying to forward the multimedia 1.0 standard, right? So if you're going to buy any PC, you need at least this level of DOS, this speed CD-ROM, this much memory, right? So trying to, to build there. But as we know, yeah. with a standard like that, you yeah, know, no, no, it, I'm sorry, I didn't mean yeah. that part was nuts. Sorry, Chris. Oh. I didn't mean that part <laughs> no, 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 you're good. The standard I agree with. It's charging the hardware companies to comply with the standard. That's what was nuts. They were trying to get three dollars each from uh, for every unit made or something like that. Yeah, and trying the, to make the trying to make money on the were gonna lose money on it as it was. It, it turned out instead of us charging the hardware people, we ended up giving money to the hardware people to try to make it more palatable to them because they yeah. were you know, hoping that their investment would pay off in the long run and that, you know, yeah. that enough people would get behind it that they'd make money in the long run. But in the short run, all the hardware manufacturers were losing dough off of it. That's the yeah. part where you miscalculated how that, you know, because at the same time, it was one of the, the great uh, uh, never-ending debates of the 3DO, how much memory to put in the thing. Mm -hmm. And... You know, at one point it was only one meg. Then at one point it was eight meg. Then it was two. Then I think we ended up with four, if I recall, is where we ended up. But uh, you know, we we constantly sit down at the whiteboard and say, we're going to put this much in. We're going to units going to have to sell for this much. And one of the hardware people who I despise would constantly <laughs> stand up at the whiteboard and say, yes, but in two years, memory is going to cost only one dollar. No, it's not going to cost only. It's still going to be ten dollars. It's still going to be, and instead it'd be fifteen dollars. You know, and mm -hmm. memory was always the bugaboo. I spent a bunch of years at Sony. I made really good friends with this wonderful player at Sony named Buzz, and Buzz, Buzz Burrows. Buzz is mm -hmm. my favorite thing that he ever said to me over all the years. Was he said this is back ten years ago, fifteen years ago now? He said, you know. I don't know anything about the PlayStation 10, except I know one thing. It doesn't have enough memory. <laughs> <laughs> That's also very true. And also the hidden gem for me on the 3DO library is this wonderful game called Twisted. Really yeah. the very first interactive game show that really showed what you could do when you mixed you know, a traditional type of game with video. Okay, so in the interest of time too, I'm gonna rip through two things. So we know what kind of happened with the 3DO. You know, it makes its way out into the world. It comes out really at a, at a very high price um, based on what it could do. And it starts dropping the price quickly. And then you start to see other um, companies try to, to, to jump on board. And the Sega CD comes out and it kind of 
stalled the market. It was in that moment where you had the Jaguar by Atari and you had the 3DO that sat in between the 16-bit and the next generation 32-bit system. Still a lot of love for the, the 3DO. Um, so we're gonna jump into Q&A for a minute, but I did wanna share with everybody uh, this one interview piece that, that you and I did. Um, wait, wait. Go, please. Can I real fast go, if you haven't seen Twisted, go uh, look up Twisted. It's a remarkable accomplishment. It is. I loved it. I, we, we, it is the game that we, my family and my kids consistently played right on, on the 3DO. It's like, it is the gem, one of the gems in the library there. So definitely everybody, please give some love for Twisted. Okay, so here's one last piece I wanted to share about you um, before we just open it up real quickly. And we're going to do, um, if people want to post their questions in the chat, I'll start going through them. So you can start now while I share this one last thing. Um, RJ, when I had you in the interview chair, I asked you about why you love what you do and you know how you internalize that. What is it? What is the meaning, your, your meaning for this? And, you know, through, throughout the discussion we've had here today and knowing you, you know, your whole thing was you wanted to, to change the world, to make, it, to make it happier, to bring joy to people, to kind of push the, the bounds of things. And I asked you about code and how you thought about code. And your response was, when I write code, I write it like I write a good story. I want people to know what my intent was. I want them to be able to follow it. And so I write code like I'd write a good story. And when I see it execute, it moves me profoundly. And that is one of the, the, the answers throughout all of that work that you can see verbatim, I can recite it because it speaks to the essence that, uh, of so many of us that grew up being empowered by video games and, and systems as children and made it our life's career. Can you expand on that? Do you still feel the same way today as you did that, you know, naive, we don't know what we're doing, but damn it, we're gonna change the world to engineer at Amiga. You know, Chris, is one of the things that makes me happiest about my career is I've always kept uh, not just a finger, but a whole hand in programming. I, I, I long time ago created Michael.org, www.michael.org, and I had to learn Perl so I could be my own sysadmin. And and I, I I did SIMD programming at Sony. Oh my God, if you've never done SIMD programming, what a mind messer that is, man. And uh, and even at Sony, I've been uh, and at Sony at Google now. I'm uh, I, I have created a tool that I've been uh, had some huge success with recently with uh, the natural language stuff, and uh, wrote a, a tool that is a, uh, a an interesting way for exploring the capabilities of natural language models and and I, I single handedly did the back end myself and did just what you said. I, I said, whatever, how many years ago that was, that's what I do. When I need to write a program, I sit down and write the whole thing out first in comments and not cheap old little comments, but I write full prose. I'll write it out with, you know, full periods and, and tables where I need them and stuff like that. And then uh, filling out the code is, is simply a matter of filling out what the comments tell me to do. One of the things I've learned over the years is not to stop, start from the top, but to start from the bottom. It's one of the big mistakes that we made with the Amiga computer. One of the reasons why we were so happy to have a chance to do the 3DO because it, the 3DO gave us a chance to do that full multitasking device-driven operating system again. But this time we did resource management and memory management. We did everything right the second time around. The 3DO was a much more professional machine, much more satisfying from an engineering and from a professional accomplishment perspective, much less of a human undertaking, much less of a that personal mission thing that we all had. 3DO was about making money, was about getting a good system out there would make us all rich, you know, and stuff like that. We, we wanted to do a beauty system, but we wanted to 
we wanted it to be a rock solid professional device. We were not going to have the kinds of crashes that the Amiga had, but I've learned the hard way now to start from the bottom. And now when I write code, the first thing I write is code that fails. And all my code fails right from the beginning and returns error messages all the way up to the top. Nope, fail, fail, fail. And then I slowly go and fix the failures one by one until finally the whole thing is working for me. And then I'm Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. All right, RJ, I have taken enough of your time. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to put a little uh, applause in here. Thank you, my friend, for for taking time with, with all of us today. And I want to give people the chance to, to ask questions here. And, and again, you know, I mean, just you are just an incredibly inspiring human being apart from all the work that you do. So um, it, it's a privilege uh, all of these years. All right, let's go to the first question. Uh, the Amiga is kept alive today thanks to its vibrant community that continues to develop new hardware and software. Do you keep up to date with what's going on with the Amiga? Yes, I happily keep up to date with what's going on with the Amiga. There was, uh, they, for some reason, the, uh, about well, when the 30th reunion started a bunch of years ago now, uh, it's cascaded into this thing where Amiga user groups all around the world want to have their own annual reunion party. And, and it's it, like now every, well, we, we went for two years off because of the quarantine, but they're already now announcing them to happen later this year and it's gonna start up again. And it feels like that same thing. There's last I heard, which is a few years old now, but somebody had did it, done a count and estimated that there were still 400,000 Amiga computers in use out there. 400,000 people are working with the CPU that clocks in at seven megahertz, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Megahertz, megahertz. Megahertz. Oh, I know. I know. You know, it's so wonderful when you go back and you, you're doing talks and stuff and you explain to people, no, this thing, you know, had not, not the Amiga, but when you talk about older, oh, it says 5K of memory. And you go, 5K? Yeah, that's 16 times smaller than the icon you click to get on the internet, right? So that's wonderful. All right, next question. Um, the, so uh, the, my first experience of VR was flying aces on virtuality powered by an Amiga 3000. What was your take? What's your take on modern VR today? And why do you think it's taken so long to take off? Oh, sadly, people aren't going to like me for saying this, but sometimes I think VR is never going to take off. I, I've seen it now in my career three times. This is the third time that they're trying. And this mm -hmm. time was the biggest and the best. This time they had televisions in the home with, you know, you would be able to find people that actually had the goggles in their home. We saw theater after theater convert to be able to, being able to do that for us. And it lasted for years, but it's all dying out and it's all going away again. And, and, and I don't know exactly why. I, I probably could pontificate on this for an hour if we wanted to really get in the depth about what's going on. But I think finally, I think finally why it'll never really take off is was represented accidentally in an early Oculus commercial. I saw they had, I can't remember some rock, rap star, some rap star is at a, a party and you can see the party's going out through the, the back. There's a sliding door and there's a swimming pool back there and people are partying. But the rap star is in the foreground wearing a, an Oculus and looking at a TV and someone opens the sliding glass door and says, hey, bro, come out and join the party. So now nah, I'm busy watching myself perform and cut to, you know, and the person's right there on the stage watching the rap star right from five inches away. And it's a spectacular thing to see. And it was so cool. Yes, you're right there on the stage and you can feel the energy of the performance. But what I saw was a whole party of people out there and some guy coming in the door. Yep. Hey, brah, come and join us. And I think that's what's always going to be the thing about VR is that to enjoy VR, I have to do this. And I, I don't want to do this when I'm talking with you people. I don't want yeah. to. You know, RJ, I, I agree with you just as an aside. You know, the thing that we forget is that we are tactile creatures. So much of it's human. I mean, there are studies done that show, you know, infant mortality rates for orphans that are not, you know, um, picked up and catered to. We literally are creatures that die without contact, right? The best controllers we have are, are our bodies, the physicality of our world. We have to remember that's part of what makes us human is that 
that physical, you know, real connection. You know, I only had the chance to meet m m basically all of my colleagues at AWS for the first time in two years at GDC. You know, as somebody who is an extrovert, right, and loves that, that's a difficult thing to be. So I think, you know, VR is a stopgap on the way to a blended experience that doesn't remove the physicality of who we are, right, as, as people. Ding, 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 ding. And meanwhile, uh, along those lines, let me not just knock Oculus because uh, also I uh, yeah. have had a chance to see some behind the scenes stuff where it's Oculus Interactive, two people together working with each other with that stuff. And there are things not only that are, you know, just going to be so cool like that, but, uh, you know, we all heard about the doctor showing up at the space station recently and stuff like that. That's the stuff you're talking about, Chris. That's where it's really going. It's, but it's not going to be the complete VR thing. It's going to be right. this, this what you're talking about, where it's the right. next generation. Yeah, I think and we'll, so. All right. And, and I, this is a question I will ask for everyone. You don't get to answer it. I don't think we have a mechanism, but it's a question I always like to ask when I'm, I'm giving a public speech and we're talking about VR and all of this stuff. The question is, you, could you imagine a world where you have access to all of the world's internet information, all of the information of the whole world and your, all of your own personal information in great detail. So when you're at a party, some person that's walking across the room from you at the party, your brain is telling you that person's name is this and that person's spouse is this and has this kind of pets and yada, yada, all of that stuff. Can you imagine that you could have access to all of that information all the time but the cost is that you have to have a physical jack. You have to have an actual physical jack in your body that connects to your nervous system. Would mm -hmm. you pay that price and have that yep. physical jack in order to get all of the information of the world? All right, so you and I are gonna have that discussion certainly because then the thing that I challenge you with, and I'm gonna go on to some more questions before we run out of time is, um, then having all that information also means that we remove another piece of who we are as human beings, which is the element of discovery, of delight and surprise, of common connection. That's the stuff that creates those chemical bonds in your brain of, I didn't realize I knew you for all these years, and this is something that we enjoyed together. Because we are complex, you know, wonderful, messy creatures. And part of the joy of getting to know each other is discovering those things. So, all right, let's park that one. That's more philosophical. Uh, we'll get to that one. Um, if you could, well, thank you, sir. If you could snap your fingers and change one thing about the games industry today, what would it be? Uh, I think the reason that, uh, that Apple is winning the game space over Android is the same thing that we saw before that uh, Apple has a tight fist and so it's got a quality control that Android doesn't have because Android doesn't control the market with the tight fist. And I wish there was a way that we could develop the way I love to develop for Android, but make the kind of money that you can make from Apple. If I could twinkle my nose and make something happen, I would make Android Develop, good Android developers, I'd make them all fabulously wealthy. That's awesome. <laughs> all righty. Which, all right, next question. Which engineers from the Commodore handoff did you admire or felt confident with them keeping the platform alive? So when you left Commodore, can you think about who remained that really worked and endeavored to keep the platform alive? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, well, you know, uh, most of the Amiga crew was still there when I left. And all of them, of course, but I, I, I simply honestly can't think of a bad actor over on the Commodore side of the engineering staff. They were all just brilliant. And I mean, I mean, there was some people who didn't, didn't adjust and were more Commodore 64 thinking people hate to say it, but it was a slightly older people typically. And they, they really didn't get with the program of the Amiga that well the, in terms of the engineering production staff, but boy, the engineers were all just brilliant. It's the marketing I would change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, RJ, what are your ideas to improve diversity 
in the video game developer community? Do you feel that we're trending as an industry in the right in in the right direction? Um, boy, that's such a great question. Because, you know, I, I've I've for many companies now in in a row, uh, present company included, the the you know it's been that's been such a major issue to confront both at the the hiring level which i'm i'm delighted to say at my level we go so far as i'm i'm part of of the hiring process at google and i i personally go so far as to completely anonymize the candidates that come in front of me so i have I don't even know the candidate's name most of the time. And not only, mm -hmm. I mean, do we hide all the gender stuff, but I don't even know the candidate's name because you can get away with that stuff. Um, but the, the truth is they don't show up at the door. There's not diversity in the population. It's not just that the companies aren't doing it. What we need to do, I believe, and there's stuff like STEM and STEAM that are making this happen that I'm personally behind. Plus there's this whole women in the industry thing that I've been a big supporter of Google for five, six years now. But um, it's, it's efforts like that, because even that one, there's a, a, a person over at um, uh, Sony that is one of the big uh, producers over there that's helped us with women in the industry a lot, Connie, Connie Booth. She's just mm -hmm. a brilliant player who shines at, at that kind of job. And, um, you know, I, 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 I've been working with them a lot with that stuff, but, you know, we're all aware that it's what we really need to do is change our, our thinking at the, the deepest levels. And I did that in my own house. I managed to have kids that went all over the place in terms of science and engineering. And actually, I didn't end up with a single engineer, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Me either. Me either. No Star Wars, no real, like, super video game people, but... Yeah, but you know, one of the things that, like, my my daughter, when she was in Girl Scouts and she was little, she's off in college now studying marketing, too. So we'll have to have a conversation with her. Um, Girl Scouts actually created an interactive entertainment badge. And so I went and spoke to a bunch of different Girl Scout groups about why we need more women in games, why we need more girls in STEM and these sorts of things. And their troop, we went and made a little Space Invaders game where each of their faces were one of the invaders and then one of the girls was the cannon at the bottom. And they were amazed that this was so accessible to them. And what, what made it tangible was the fact that these tools are readily accessible now to anybody that has an idea that they want to bring to the world, which kind of goes back to the ethos of the Amiga and the work that you, you know, kind of did, which is how do you empower people through technology to let them express themselves and to make the world a better place, right? Yeah, yeah. And you said something earlier. I, I think we're probably almost out of time. We let are. me repeat something you said before, I be, it, because it's something that that I've been, you know, thinking deeply about now for decades, and and I think. The one thing that has been my prime motivator over my whole life is that I just love to make people happy. I love to increase the joy around me. And mm -hmm. yeah, you know, as we've said here, we didn't really dwell on that too much, but that was my prime mover for joining Amiga and for working as hard as I did. And it wasn't just me. There was a lot of us in the company that were doing it because we wanted to bring computing power to the common person we wanted to be able to to you know a power and and all of those capabilities and games wonderful entertainment and stuff but low cost so that any person could afford it any person could play with it we were starting out with entertainment but then when the stuff started happening like the Lux paint and the text craft and all these other things that people were doing with the Amiga, we were empowering people all around the world to, to get involved with this. I still, it's one of my great joys in life, still a, to this day, about once a month or so, I'll get an email from someone, my gosh, you know, it's the Amiga that started me in my career and, and I became a graphic designer. I got into hardware, country, whatever, you know, something. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, and, and that, I could not ask for something better than to, to know that all that hard work that we put into it actually did that, made people 
better versions of themselves, help them become more enriched and, and powerful than they might have been otherwise. God, I just... You know, and RJ, uh, you know, I, I know that you hear that from people all the time, but you'll never really uh, be able to experience the full breadth of the lives that you've impacted. And, you know, I was having a, a conversation with a colleague earlier this morning where I said, you know, the thing that I think about all the time, right, and we've had this discussion in, our, in the game night stuff that we do, right, is at the end of the day, why are you doing what you're doing? When you have a group of people that have decided to take a risk in their lives, to get their family to support them, to create art and to create story and to, and to bring an idea into the world, we have to be very protective of that. We have to understand that it doesn't matter all of the hardware and technology and pipes and money and everything spent. If it isn't making the lives of the people that depend on it better, why are we doing it, right? And and it's it's just otherwise it's disposable it, it doesn't mean anything the, the technology in the world has to find at the end of the day it's it's root in making people better making people happier and you've certainly done that throughout the course of your career so we are at time so rj i want to say another applause for mr michael thank you so much